great to be here uh, with all of you. And so well, this, you know, this triangle, triangle, triangle. Why, why is it all triangles, guys? Why do you need triangles everywhere? I'm not afraid. You're afraid. Tristan Harris, Center for Human, Te Humane, Center for Humane Technology. Okay, not human, but humane. All right, let's see. Oh, is this not the guy? Is this is this the guy? Oh, oh, it's not the guy, right? Okay, well, let's, I should. Uh, all right, I just actually want to see what this guy is all about. Let's just get talking. So great to see the broad range of of topics that have been covered, because it's really more. It's so much more than just misinformation. We often think about social media as kind of creating the climate change of culture. And what I hope to do is sort of broaden and maybe zoom out a bit on what are the collective effects of uh, technology. I don't know. I don't know if you guys could read this, but it's saying like, excuse me, a thought provoking talk by technology ethicist Tristan Harris on the race between technology creators and our regulation on AI and our ever increasing addiction to social media. Harris proposes that when we were when we are creating this technology, we need to look further than blaming big tech on providing platforms for disinformation. We we'll balance the power of creation of technologies with our responsibility to govern and understand it. All right, let's see what he's got to say. And humanity. We often start our presentations with this quote by E.O. Wilson, the Harvard sociobiologist, who said, the real problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions or brains, medieval institutions, <laughs> and godlike technology. And it's, it's so clear. We repeat it in every presentation because I just feel like it's... It... The, reason, the reason they think they have godlike technology is because they think they, they have like the nuclear bomb to, that, that can destroy all mankind and all this stuff. And they think that they have like... I mean, I'm just telling you, I think a lot of the technology, quote unquote, that they say they have, they don't really have. So let's just put it out there anyway. So quickly summarizes the feeling that we have, that our brains are not matched with the way that our technology is influencing our minds, which is what you've been hearing about all day today. And so oftentimes we talk about um, the alignment problem in, in AI, right? How do we align AI with humanity? Well, how do we align our brains with our institutions having a steering wheel over something that's godlike that's moving a million times faster, especially as we have large language models, like AIs that are gonna be moving way faster. Who here is sort of feeling the explosive rate of AI moving in the world, right? That's going to supercharge so many of the things you've been hearing about and what I'll kind of talk about today. Now, um, many of you here hey, have probably seen social dilemma. Have actually seen the social dilemma? Okay, good. Maybe a good third of you. The social dilemma mm -hmm. was a Netflix documentary I was a part of. That was this is a good, this is a good question, our TMP3. Uh, we'll take a look at it. That's uh, Daniel chapter four, I believe. We'll take a look at it in a bit actually seen by more than 125 million people in 190 countries and 30 languages about the effects that social media had on humanity. It was rewiring the flows of attention uh, and information in our society. And what we actually talk about is that people might have missed that was actually first contact between humanity and AI. We say, how is the AI going to affect humanity? Well, we actually already had an AI that rewired and was misaligned with humanity. Because when you swipe your finger on TikTok or swipe your finger on Twitter or swipe your finger on YouTube, you activated a supercomputer pointed at your brain to calculate based on what 3 billion other human social primates have watched, seen, or looked at, what is the perfect next thing to show you when you swipe, right? That was first contact. How did it go? <clears throat> so in first contact with social media, I hope you can see these slides here, we have information overload, doom scrolling, loneliness crisis, the influencer culture, sexualization of young kids, which angle makes me look the best, uh, polarization, bots and deepfakes, and basically the breakdown of our shared reality. Collectively, these effects are something like the climate change of culture. It's so much better. If we just had good information in our information environment, we would still have doom scrolling. Um, if you just had good information in our information environment, you'd still have a loneliness crisis because people would be by themselves on a screen scrolling by themselves, and that would affect the belonging. See what, see what, see what they try to put, like, okay, information overload, okay, okay. Addiction, okay. I guess people are addicted to social media. Doom scrolling, yeah, okay, that's a problem. Influencer culture, yeah, that's a problem. Sexual sexualization of kids, yeah, that was um, that wasn't uh, that didn't start with social media. That started with Hollywood. Cancel culture, shortened attention spans. Cancel culture. I don't know. Was that social media caused that, or is it like leftist weirdos? Shortened attention spans. Yeah, okay. Polarization. That's because of social media, really. I mean, I guess. 
because we, we are becoming much more polarized than we were maybe like 10, 20 years ago or something. Maybe that's what they're trying to get at. Is that because of social media or is that because of um, something else? I don't know. But anyway, bots and deep fakes. Okay. Cult factories. Yeah, that's the problem on social media for sure. YouTube is bad. Fake news. Well, I don't think social media was the creator of this. It's more like they, they're the creator of fake news and then social media start calling them out for their fake news. And then they invented this phrase, fake news, because the social media people were calling them out on all their fake news events. <laughs> so they, they developed this thing to this, this whole, this is like what they call a limited hangout. They, they developed this word fake news to label things because people realize that the news is mostly fake breakdown of democracy yeah well i don't really see a breakdown of democracy buddy so i think you're kind of panicking a little too much people would be by themselves on a screen scrolling by themselves and that would affect the belonging dynamics that uh, hari just spoke to oh you think it's uh tech mix with humans that's interesting that's interesting but um I don't know. I, I, I hesitate to to tie these prophecies into things happening in our real world right now, but we'll take a look at it uh, It's possible, but I don't know. And so this is really important because as we're about to go into second contact with AI, with large language models, we haven't really fixed this first misalignment. We lost. How did we lose to this AI? How did we lose in this first contact? Well, what were the stories we were telling ourselves? It seems really aligned, right? Uh, social media is going to connect people with their friends. We're going to give people what they want. We're going to show people the most personalized ads that are relevant to them, only the things that they would want to buy. These stories that we were telling ourselves are true. But that somehow hid what was underneath all that, which is other speakers have talked about today, the race to maximize engagement. Because how much have you paid for your TikTok account in the last year? How much have you paid for your YouTube account in the last year? How much have you paid for your um, uh, Facebook account in the last year? Zero. How are they worth a trillion dollars in market cap? People say it's your data, but they're actually selling also your attention. So how do I get your attention? You know, we add slot machine mechanics, pull to refresh. How many likes did I get? Did I get more this time than last time? I just checked my email five seconds ago, but I'll check it again. It's not enough just to get your attention. If I'm a social media company, hmm. my goal is actually to get you addicted to getting attention from other people because a person who's validation seeking and wants attention from other people is more profitable hmm. than someone who does not care about attention from other people. So how do we do that? We add beautification filters to, uh, to it, right? And what we call the race to the bottom of the brainstem. If Snapchat adds beautification filters, Instagram will lose if they don't also add beautification filters. TikTok was found uh, to actually automatically add a beautification of like between one and 5% without even asking people because we're all users, mirror, mirror on the wall, which makes me look best of all. And we use that app, right? <laughs> now, these design decisions that again, other speakers have been talking about all day also led to the creation of this because a button that instantly retweets, reshares um, uh, this content quickly is good at creating attention addicts, right? Because now, I, if I, TikTok is literally competing with Instagram. If you post this. Yeah, I know. Listen, you know, people talk about the mark. Look, this is something kind of like people didn't even care about this stuff for most of the church's history, okay? And then now it's been kind of pushed up into our consciousness. And most Christians think this mark thing is this big thing that we have to worry about. But even if you are even if like even if like i mean i don't understand how we could ever have to worry about that if we're saved already but i guess there's people that think about this like post tribulation thing post tribulation rapture then you might have to deal with the mark business but then that's why all that stuff is weird to me that's why i don't really i don't really mess with all that uh and time stuff anymore because i don't think it's i don't think it's li li literal man i really don't video on Instagram and Instagram offers you a hundred views on average. Hey, Chris, what's up, brother? Thanks for joining. But if you post it on, um, on TikTok, you get a thousand views on average. If you're a teenager, where are you going to post your next video? TikTok. TikTok, the one that gives you the more reach. So it's a, it's a race to who can inflate your ego and give you the most instant sharing as fast as possible. And we've all seen the effects of that. Fake news spread six times faster than true news. And as other people have seen, this is the study from more in common. This has led to a massive overrepresentation, a funhouse mirror of the extreme voices to the moderate voices with this instant sharing. Because what's the difference between a moderate voice on the internet versus an extreme voice? Do extreme voices post more, they, I'll just say, it, they post more often, right? And moderate voices post infrequently. That's the first layer of the double whammy. The second is that when someone says something extreme, it goes more viral than when, something, when someone says something more moderate. 
So even though see, see a- they act like they act like okay, oh the the people that are extreme post all the time, and the people that are that are that are moderate, they 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 don't post as much. So then the extremists are are taking over the internet. But who posts all the time? It's like them. They're the ones posting all the time, and they're the ones posting the extremist stuff. Like think about like. Like you know when you know remember when when they started that thing in Israel right when they when it was like October um, two thousand twenty three right so when they when they started that thing they started telling the story about how forty babies in Israel in um, Israel got beheaded right that's what the story they were telling right and it's just because one lady from Israel <laughs> she said it on the news. Or, or the news, I don't know. So I don't know how the story started, but the news person was asking her and she was like confirming it. And then later on, it kept, it kept going, kept going. CNN, B, B, BBC, they're all reporting it. Biden, President Biden was going around saying this, right? And now we know it's just a made up story. It's just complete nonsense, right? But that's what people do. They come up with these things. They call them atrocity stories, right? They come up with these stories which are just made up, but they make the other opponent look bad. So it makes it look like, okay, we have to go to war. We have to do this, you know? Like in World War One, they said this thing about how the Germans were like raping the Belgian women. And that was the story. That was the atrocity story that got the British to kind of sign up. And it's like, they're the ones pushing the extremist weird stories, nonsense, fake news and stuff, you know? very small number of very extreme voices out there. Social media takes that like 5% of the population and then just spreads it out and stretches it out over the whole canvas and movie screen of humanity. And you run society through that funhouse mirror for about 10 years and you quickly end up in a very distorted uh, world. Uh, I don't know if you can read this. Um, this is a, a thing that says social media summarized elegantly in two tweets. The top tweet says, and I'll just zoom in really quickly, the much vaunted Pandora papers revealed that the patriotic Zelensky was storing payments from his top funder, Israel Igor Kolomowski, in offshore accounts. And this person was also a funder of a neo-Nazi battalion. And notice that that first tweet got 8,000 retweets, the top, the top one. Now, underneath it says, I was the editor and co-reporter of that story. You can look it up. You completely twisted it. There's no link between this money and anything to do with it. And that got 58 tweets. So wait, I really, wait, wait, we can all just go let's home. That that kind let's of, just, let's just say says, that again. Yeah, run society through okay. that funhouse mirror for about 10 years, and you quickly end up in a very distorted uh, world. Uh, I don't know if you can read this. Um, this okay, the much... The much vaunted Pandora Papers released revealed the patriotic President Zelensky was storing payments from his top funder, Israeli Igor Kolomoisky. In an offshore account, Kolomoisky is also founder of the neo Nazi Azov Battalion and the IR Battalion. And then Aubrey Belford replied, I was the editor and co-reporter of that story. Look it up, and I've completely twisted. There's no link between this money and anything to do with Azov. Well, um, this this tweet by this lady, right, doesn't really actually contradict what this guy's saying. This guy's not saying there's a link between the money and Azov. What he's saying is this guy Kalamowski is a funder of uh Zelensky and then also he's also a funder of the Azov battalion so this tweet this woman is putting out right does not actually contradict what this guy said right but but these stupid idiots in that audience and that and that idiot pr- philosopher guy this guy is acting like like she she got him she disproved what he said she didn't, didn't she didn't even disprove what he said I mean, I don't know if what he said is true or not. I don't know, right? But I'm just saying what she said does not contradict what he said. This is a, a thing that says social media summarized elegantly in two tweets. The top tweet says, and I'll just zoom in really quickly, the much vaunted Pandora Papers revealed that the patriotic Zelensky was storing payments from his top funder, Israel Igor Kolomowski, in offshore accounts. And this person was also a funder of the neo-Nazi battalion. And notice that that first tweet got 8,000 retweets, the top, the top one. Now, underneath it says, I was the editor and co-reporter of that story. You can look it up. You've completely twisted it. There's no link between this money and anything to do with it. And that got 58 tweets. <laughs> they're all just laughing because they, they, they're they just trained to laugh like, like seals, you know, like trained seals to just go clap, clap, you know. But that's all they that's all they know how to do. They didn't think about it. Like, what the hell? Excuse me. What did this guy just say? What did he say? 
what was wrong with that guy's tweet? There's nothing wrong with that guy's tweet. I mean, unless, I mean, nothing that she said disproves what that guy tweeted, right? So anyway. Whatever. Really, we can all just go home because that kind of summarizes <laughs> what the entire information environment looks like. And if that's the asymmetry no, of how- man. You, you're summarizing it. You're summarizing it by, this is what they do. This is what they do. They, like the internet is coming up with this good information. I don't, I don't even know about that particular story. I don't know, right? But like I say, that, that woman's tweet doesn't contradict the other guy's tweet. But whatever. The point is, there is good information coming up through the internet, right? And then when we start to try to speak it, then these people like this, they'll try to put us down and then they'll they'll act like that, like how they're acting right there. They're just like, ha, 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 oh, those silly, those silly uh, Facebookers or those silly tweeters. They don't know what's going on. They're just laughing at them, right? But they didn't even think about what just happened in there. They didn't even look at those tweets, what they actually said. This is what people do, man. Anyway. Power that we have granted to every actor in the information ecosystem, right? We have been living in this uh, funhouse mirror. And so we got to a world that looks like this, the climate change of culture. Um, and we have another Climate change. Up. Climate change. That's another one, right? So now, now with the internet, people are starting to realize that climate change is a dumb, nonsense, unscientific, foolish myth, right? But with these guys, they're like, oh, it's because of the social media. That's why people don't believe in climate change. No, it's because we're like, we're not idiots like you. We don't, we actually use our brains and think about it. You guys are just like, well, the scientists said so. And so you guys are anti-science, you know, because it's like, man, shut up, idiots. I, so that I highly stand. recommend folks, you know, I have a short amount of time today, but you should check out this talk we, we recently gave called the AI Dilemma that talks about the second contact, which unfortunately I won't have time to talk about today. So what's the solution to this problem? Well, is it content moderation? Is it fact checking? Is, it tr is information true versus false? Well, what about all the sort of salaciousness that has partial truths that are spun? What about if we vilify the CEOs, right? One of the things that I think we really need to get good at is recognizing that the complexity of our problems actually has exceeded the institutions. The complexity of our world is going up, right? Pandemics, what's the right way to respond to pandemic? What's going on with COVID? See, oh, the pandemic. pandemic, the pandemic, guys, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna, how are we gonna survive? How are we gonna respond? It's, it's, the complexity is going up and up. It's so complex, you know what I mean? And then what they're gonna, what they're basically gonna say here is how can we like control the conversation so that all these, all our little like slaves out in there in the in the social media world won't uh, ask too many questions when we tell them to take a vaccine. How do we deal with energy crises, debt crises, finance, uh, GDP to um, debt to GDP ratio, misinformation, the complexity of all these issues, also combinatorically, right? And then simul simultaneously, our ability to respond to that complexity, both as our brains and our institutions, right? So our paleolithic brains in our, in our institutions collectively is, represents humanity's ability to respond to the complexity of our problems. But what is runaway technology adding to this? Well, runaway technology, AI, steepens the curve of complexity because if synthetic biology was a threat before, AI supercharges the threat of synthetic biology. If misinformation was a threat before, then generative media supercharges the threat of, gener of, of misinformation because people can publish uh, just yesterday, two days ago, um, Pentagon, right, was, there's a fake image of the Pentagon being bombed. If I wanted to cause a bank run in the United States, I could, if I'm Russia or China, I could easily just create photos of people standing in front of li lines of people standing in front of Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, et cetera. I can devalue the US dollar like that. There's no Department of Homeland Security or, you know, Patriot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be so easy for the Chinese and the Russians to do that. All they have to do is just make a, make a, couple, a bunch of pictures of people standing in front of the banks. And it'll look like there's a bank run and then and then everybody will panic and then the whole American economy will collapse. The threat is real, guys. The threat is real. We have to basically hand over all our all our freedom of speech to these people so that they can control the information so that we won't get like so the Chinese won't like put a deep fake uh bank run in, in the in the intern webs. So dumb. The missile defense system is gonna stop someone from doing something like that. And there's a million more examples like that, by the way. And so what I, the reason I'm going here is that I think we are often thinking too narrowly about how to solve these problems. We're thinking about content moderation and fact checking, when really it's about how do we have wisdom? How do we have the bottom line, our brains and our institutions and our social trust and our social fabric actually match the speed and complexity of the, of the evolutionary curve of technology <laughs> and our issues? Wisdom, wisdom. The key to closing the gap is wisdom. Yeah, that's true. But do you guys have wisdom? Do you guys who deny God? deny the the source of all wisdom do you guys have wisdom no 
No, you don't. But this way, if your immune system has a slower evolutionary pace than a virus has a fast evolutionary pace, which is going to win, your immune system or the virus? The virus. Our immune system are... Well, how come, how come the virus is never won? How come the... If, if the viruses evolve faster than our immune system, right? And they've been evolving the entire time that humans have existed on the planet Earth, right? How come viruses never beat us? How come we are we are winning and viruses are not winning, right? So what's happening? What are you talking about? Because these guys are like... I don't know, man. I don't know what it is. Their whole their whole mentality, because this guy, the, this guy, I don't think he even knows. He's not like one of these shills who actually knows. He's one of these shills that they they think that they're just like a smart philosophy guy and he's and he's successful. That's all he thinks. He thinks he thinks he's doing a good job here. I mean, that's what it, that's what it appears to me. I could be wrong, but the way he's talking, so so. These people, man, they honestly think that they're that they're going to save the world or something. You know, it's so sad. Technology and our issues. Think of it this way. If your immune system has a slower evolutionary pace than a virus has a fast evolutionary pace, which is going to win your immune system or the virus? The virus. Our immune system are our institutions, our governance, our regulation. And that's why we have to upgrade those institutions. <laughs> our immune system. So now he's trying to say that what he's trying to say, right, is that is that, OK, so so our technology is ramping up it's ramping up guys it's a threat now it's it's ramping up so fast that that it's going to take over our society and we're going to have like fake news and and the russians are going to send like pictures of like people at the bank and it's going to be a bank run and all this stuff right and then and then but what's really going on is that is that they're trying to make us panic so that we'll, we'll hand over our rights to them so, that, so they're, they're trying to make it so like, oh, we, we need the government to ramp up control. Otherwise, the whole Internet's going to gonna like destroy our society and stuff, you know? So then, I don't know, so dumb. What this means is that the sense-making and choice-making of humanity in terms of both individually uh, and in terms of our regulation, in terms of how our institutions act, has to... All right, all right, yeah, because you had a couple of comments about climate change now. So, all right, we'll talk about climate change in a minute. Climate change is fake. Match the complexity of the world. And I, I wanted to reframe what this means is that the sense making and choice making of humanity in terms of both individually uh, and in terms of our regulation, in terms of how our institutions act, has to match the complexity of the world. And I, I wanted to reframe what we're here to do, which is to also say, in addition to dealing with the information ecosystem, we need an information ecosystem that is, I think, collapsing these lines together where the quality of our sense making and choice making matches the complexity of choices that we face. And one way maybe of saying that, to go back to E.O. Wilson, is that we need to embrace our Paleolithic brains, upgrade our medieval institutions, and bind the race dynamics of the godlike technology. And just to give some subtle examples of this, what do we mean by embrace our Paleolithic brains? You've been hearing from people today talking about confirmation bias, like uh, Ezem's talk about um, uh, the social. Yeah, I think I think that's law. basically what it is, Chris. Like it's just like when when they brought in Trump so that they could they could push the vax, you know, or those kind of things. Like it's like. The right was kind of on side with him when when he wanted to push those things, and so that's why they were able to, to get it. I don't think I don't think they would have been able to get that off if they had like a leftist in office. So now when they bring him back, then it's probably like that. Yeah, like they need to, they need somebody that that the right kind of trusts, and then people will kind of go along with them. But what? Do, yeah, they are just gonna basically. I mean, he's gonna just basically support Israel. He's gonna support like more like loss of our rights and stuff, you know, they're going to make it look like he's moving it to the right, but he's really moving it to the left. Longing, that is embracing what it means to be human. You know, our name, the Center for Humane Technology is named as such because my co-founder, um, Aza Raskin, his father was the inventor of the Macintosh project at Apple. He wrote a book called The Humane Interface. And the word humane means having an honest reflected view in the mirror of how does our brains really work. That's how he came up with and was conceiving of the Macintosh, because the Macintosh, different than the personal computer with a blinking green cursor and a command line interface, was a very non-ergonomic way to match our brains. But the Macintosh with the mouse and the menu bar and drag and drop and icons was a much more humane interface because it embraced how we really work on the inside. But now what we need to do is apply those kinds of insights to um, our brains have confirmation bias. We need to feel belonging rather than loneliness. So how would technology embrace these aspects of what it means to be human and design in a richer way? If we were to get rid of the engagement-based business models that sell our advertising, when you open up Facebook, Facebook could be ranked instead of which content should I show you. It could be ranked in terms of what are things that I can do with different communities around me in, in my physical environment. They could be supercharging the reinstantiation and the reflowering of the social fabric. Instead of showcasing virtual Facebook groups, they could be showcasing actual physical communities that people could spend time with each other. 
because as many people have found out, when you spend physical time with people face to face, it automatically has healing properties, right? Just building trust, building connection. Upgrading our medieval institutions, <clears throat> one of the limits of our institutions right now is they deal with acute harms, discrete harms. I was just going to say, he's problem. saying right in the triangle, right? Right in the triangle. So his face is like the eye. You know what I mean? Why do they do this? I mean, I, I know why they do it, but it's weird how, like, anyway. Products hurt this person, but it doesn't deal with diffuse, chronic, um, and long term cumulative harms. Think climate change, think forever chemicals in our atmosphere, think climate change of culture, slow rolling increases in mental health issues, uh, addiction, loneliness, et cetera, in society. <laughs> climate change of culture. You see, so it's like, so they make this thing, this climate change thing, which is like, oh, this disaster that's going to come and destroy our society, right? So we have to get ready. We have to do something, guys. We have to do something. We need, we need to pay more taxes and then, then they'll solve the problem, you know? And then he's trying to bring that thing in over into, into the climate change of the culture, you know what I mean? So the, the, the culture, there's a disaster in our culture, guys. We need to like, we need, like we need more policies. To deal with those long-term cumulative health issues, uh, addiction, loneliness, et cetera, in society. We need institutions that deal with those long-term cumulative diffuse issues rather than just the acute issues. Liability, for example, is something that we need for AI companies that's coming down the pipe, but liability only deals with an acute issue, like someone died while using a car or you know, using a product. And in terms of binding our godlike technology, we need to actually recognize when there's a race. If I don't do it, I lose to the guy that will, right? If I don't uh, use social media for my nonprofit to try to boost up my influence, I'll just lose to the other nonprofits that boost up their influence with social media. So it becomes a race to create this virtual amount of influence on, online. Um, if I don't deploy open AI to as, as many people as possible and deploy AI into Snapchat, because now every kid on Snapchat has a my AI bot at the top, a friend who will always, always answer your questions um, and will always be there when their other friends go to bed at 10 p.m., Snapchat is going to win if they do that versus the other companies that don't. So as we are deploying this godlike technology, we need to actually recognize, not be upset at bad guys, bad CEOs, but get upset at bad games, bad races. And that would be another form of upgrading our institutions. And just to sort of close, a quote that we reference all the time. Wait, wait, what? What is he saying? Like, so we're not going to get mad at the bad CEOs. Like, we're not going to get mad at the Snapchat CEO because he put the AI thing there. We're going to get mad at the fact that there's this race between snapchat and like facebook and instagram or whatever they all want to put the ai bot now because snapchat put it and now they're gonna win unless everybody puts it so we should be mad at that race the fact that there's a race between these guys but what what does that do what does that do so we get mad at that like what does that have to do with anything bro? this is not a solution this guy's not giving us a solution to anything right now he's just telling us like what what is this? <laughs> this like I don't know. I don't know why these guys like even talk. Like why are you even here, man? Time is that you cannot have the power of gods without the wisdom, love, and prudence of gods. If you have more power than you have wisdom or responsibility, that by definition means you are going to be creating effects in society that you can't see because you have more power than you have awareness of what those effects are. Think of it as you know people are now in, uh, aware of things like a, a biosafety level four laboratory uh, from the Wuhan, Wuhan Institute of Virology. If you have biosafety level four capabilities where you're developing pathogens, you need biosafety level four safety practices. As we're developing AI, we are now inventing biosafety level 10 level capabilities, but we haven't even invented what biosafety level 10 practices would need to be. And one of the hardest things I think humanity is going to have to do in looking in the mirror is thinking about how do we bind and limit the power that we're handing out to the appropriate level of wisdom and responsibility. The biggest mistake we made with social media is handing out godlike powers of instant resharing to everyone, which can be very helpful in certain cases. But it's helpful specifically because it's bound to wisdom when it's when it's going well, and when it's not going well, it's because that power is not bound to wisdom. So those are some thoughts I wanted to uh, leave you with today. Thank you very much. <laughs> so dumb. wisdom, wisdom, quote unquote wisdom, dude. This guy's like <laughs> the thing he was saying about the uh... those effects are. Think of it as you know people are now in, uh, aware of things like a a biosafety. So so he's in, now he's going to talk about the biosafety hazard uh, level of like safety level, right? So it's, it's the level four laboratory uh, from the Wuhan, Wuhan Institute of Virology. If you have biosafety level four capabilities where you're developing pathogens, you need biosafety level four safety practices. As we're developing AI, we are now inventing biosafety level ten level capabilities, but we haven't even invented what biosafety level ten practices would need to be. And one of the hardest things I think humanity is going to have to do in looking see, at See, like, I swear, it's just all like a fear thing, you know? Like, first of all, okay, look, I don't know. I don't know what you guys think about that thing with the COVID thing. But, I mean, we can talk about that. But I don't think that that was that much of a threat, first of all, right? And so the fact that these guys are trying to say, oh, it's biosafety level four. And, and then we need biosafety level four procedures. And then 
And then he's like, he's like, oh, with, with AI, now we have biosafety level 10 viruses. Well, what? It's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like we're supposed to be scared of biosafety level four, but that even that wasn't a threat anyway, right? They're just making that into a threat. They just made us scared of it. There's nothing scary there. And so what what am I supposed to be scared of biosafety level 10 now? I don't, I'm not, I'm not scared of it. But you're scared of it and you're trying to make people scared of it. Yeah, their world, yeah, their wisdom is worldly, man. I don't know what quote you mean, Gusty, but sorry, man. The solution is the to their problem they created. Yeah, I know. I know. They create, yeah, exactly. They drink their own Kool-Aid. Exactly, man. They drink their own Kool-Aid, they make their own problems, and then they then they make their they make a problem, then they act like we have to clean it up. But nah, you guys made it. 